let me introduce the, uh, the chair for the panel discussion, Dr. Adam Roberts, who is uh, a familiar uh, expert uh, and uh, as a faculty member at the, uh, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, he does fantastic work on uh, mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance to implementation of new drug um, or, or translation into new drug discovery uh, and um, implementing some of those solutions. Uh, we have a wonderful panel. He will introduce the panel. May I invite uh, Dr. Adam Roberts to chair the session? Thank you very much, George. And thank you also to Tamar and to the Society for giving me quite a privileged opportunity to uh, chair this panel with uh, a group of esteemed experts who I'll now ask if they could come up and take their seats, please. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do with this uh, panel session is ask each panel member to introduce themselves uh, using only one to two minutes because what I found over the previous day is that the most exciting part of the panel discussions is when we have the interaction with the audience. So I want to move on to audience participation and questions as soon as possible. Um, and that will be evident in my first question to the panel and hopefully my only question to the panel as well. Uh, there's a little bit of excitement. If your mobile phone goes off, a microphone will find its way to you and you'll be expected to ask a question as well. That'll be nice and exciting. Um, and also, finally, before I ask the panel to introduce themselves, any questions for uh, Gadar from her wonderful keynote presentation, please feel free to ask when, with the microphone coming around to you as well. So we'll have both questions for Gadar and also questions for the wider panel. So without any further ado, if I could ask uh, the panel members from Michael to me to introduce yourself, maybe one or two minutes. Thank you, Adam. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. So my name is Michael Cawley. I oversee public affairs for the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, which, if you don't know, is a learner society and a charity. been around for about 50 years. Um, we have two peer-reviewed journals. We focus specifically on providing open access education and training on stewardship for our friends and colleagues, especially in low- and middle-income countries, where we work very closely together to understand, in the way that Garda uh, described, to understand their needs and to pro uh, help meet those needs. For myself, I am a history and politics graduate. I'm a trained journalist, so I don't have any medical or scientific background apart from working for the society over the last six years. But I will say that in the 10 or 15 years that I've been working in public affairs, I focus very much on um, social justice issues, and I see this in, in, that, in that space. Um, finally, all of that comes together through the work that we do in, in Westminster. So one of the things that I do is help to provide the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group on antibiotics, bringing together, as the name would suggest, political representatives from um, every party and from both houses. So a very important way of working together and connecting them with the experts, people like yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Catherine. Uh, thanks, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invite to be here to this, this morning. So I'm Catherine Moore, I'm a senior lecturer now based in St George's University of London. Um, I've spent, I'm a microbiologist by training, but I've spent my life working in global health and public health. I recently moved from Oxford to St George's. Um, I guess if I'm thinking about big things, the, the biggest thing that I've done most recently was leading the group based in Oxford, estimating the burden of AMR in partnership with IHME. And it's always good to see the slides. Um, I'm now based in St. George, George's working with uh, Mike Charland. And um, what we're trying to do is use the evidence from the Grand Project to bring it locally, to actually say, OK, we've got these numbers, we've got the evidence, but what does it mean in countries, particularly where the burden's high? So can we use that burden data along with the access to antibiotics in country and the information, so working closely with people in country, that information to help bring, um, bring antibiotic use into policy. What should they be using based on their data? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Minakshi? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Minakshi Gautam. And uh, uh, 
I'm really happy to be here. I think this is my first time uh, coming for an RS GMH meeting. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I am an assistant professor of uh, health policy and health systems research uh, in the Department of Global Health and Development at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I also have a part-time teaching position at Cambridge University in the Department of Primary uh, Care and Public Health. Um, uh, my, uh, I've worked across diverse areas of global health, uh, but my real interest is in um, semi-regulated health markets across Asia and Africa, and the social, economic, health system, policy-related, and market environment-related drivers of suboptimal antibiotic use um, in community settings where these markets are the front lines of healthcare and antibiotic provision. Um, I, in, I have led a couple of teams, um, one in India, it's known as the One Health Antibiotic Stewardship in Society uh, Research uh, Team. I've, uh, you know, I, br I brought this team together in 2016 and we've been working with policy makers, with the pharmaceutical industry, and trying to see how we can use a multi-stakeholder approach to uh, co-create and co-design antibiotic stewardship strategies, which are really practical. And even if they deviate from existing policies, which are kind of top-down, as Gada has uh, you know, explained very nicely in her uh, presentation. Uh, so we've been working uh, you know, with this kind of an approach. I'll just stop there. That's Thank you, Minakshi. And then uh, for both equity and the recording purposes, Gada, could I just ask you to introduce yourself again? <laughs> I'm sure that everybody had had enough, but nope. um, I'm Gada Zubian, I'm the Head of Partnership and Stakeholder Engagement at ICARS. By background, I am a scientist who worked in the public and private sector for years before actually moving into the UK Research Council um, for a few years leading on infectious disease and an AMR, and then the Wellcome Trust as well uh, before moving into ICARS. Thank you very much, and welcome all of you to this mm -hmm. panel discussion. So if I may um, take my prerogative as chairperson and ask the first question. Um, we heard very eloquently yesterday uh, from one of our colleagues in the audience about being in the same place that we were 20 years ago in terms of NTDs. So to start this panel discussion, I'd like to ask the panel if they feel that we are still in the same place 20 years ago in terms of AMR. And if so, is it obvious what we've not done to move forward? Are there the same people, for example, having the same conversations within an echo chamber, which leads to... Uh, Gadar's comment about not recognizing everybody's face in the room when talking about AMR, that's really refreshing. And if so, what or who else do we need to bring to this conversation to move AMR forward in the next five to ten years? Who wants to take that first? I'm looking at Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Okay, so there's quite a lot there, isn't there, obviously. Um, I would say that um, I suppose the main point of reference for most of us in, in this room is the O'Neill Review, and it's coming up for, what, ten, almost 10 years since it was commissioned by David Cameron's administration. Um, and a quick look at the Ten Commandments which came out of that review. I mean, I think it's fair to say that um, of those 10, we've done a fair bit, and I, and I would say here that the UK has done as much as anybody globally to support um, uh, through funding and resources to support the development of those aims. But it's, we're still not going far enough and we're still not going fast enough. So in terms of new drugs, I mean, that's kind of critically important, obviously. But I think all that does, uh, using quite a lot of taxpayer money, so it's a very expensive way of just setting the clock a few minutes back from midnight. Um, it buys us a bit more time, but not a lot more, because of obviously resistance develops quite quickly in relation to new drugs, the drugs that you don't want to use, and if they are used, are probably not likely to be used in the places where they're needed most. So that's a bit of a conundrum. Um, I would also say that... Um, uh, also around stewardship, there's been quite a lot of very good, very effective, but probably not so well coordinated attempts at doing stewardship. Um, I, I quite like the aims and the objectives. They're ambitious for the uh, AWARE book, the AWARE system, which is the access, watch and reserve system for, for uh, denoting which antibiotics should, should be used when. Um, and I understand that one of the targets is to basically make, um, of all antibiotics consumed by humans by 2030, 90% should come from 
um, the uh, access category, which then starts to beg the question politically, how do we gain access to the access antibiotics? So it's a kind of one-way ratchet, which I think is helpful because we need to set ambitious targets for ourselves. But of the other objectives, I mean, a global uh, awareness raising campaign, uh -uh. Um, wash, uh -uh. you know, I could go on, but um, essentially I think it all boils down to what I think in the way it was presented was the final recommendation by O'Neill, which is probably the one which we're furthest away from achieving, is the building a global coalition for real action via the G20 and the United Nations. And we have, we're just one year out from the uh, United Nations um, high level meeting, uh, General Assembly high level meeting in New York um, this time next year, where you know, we really need to get our act together, we need to get the story straight, and we need to forge a consensus and stick to it around what we want to achieve politically. I'm interested in the, unsurprisingly, the political determinants of, of health. Because if you think about it, in the final analysis, chances of survival are basically determined by the distribution of power, resources, and money. And that's it in simple terms, in crude terms. And those determinants are political. So we can do everything that we need to do in a medical or scientific sense, or even in a social or economic sense. But the context in which that activity takes place is deeply political. So for my money, I think it's now time for us all get together and call for something like a framework convention on AMR in the same way we, that we had with climate change in 1994 and the way that we've had more recently with tobacco control. Both framework conventions have led to tangible progress and a much more coherent and cohesive approach to tackling the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can I move to uh, Minakshi? Yes. Um, I, I think that question is really interesting because uh, um, I've very often thought that things are uh, remaining pretty much the same. And there's a lot of rhetoric that goes around, but in terms of practical strategies, we are still um, fumbling around. Um, I think one of the problems that I personally see is that AMR is conceptualized as another vertical, like infectious diseases, you know, like TB or like HIV or like malaria. But then it's not a vertical. It's, it's something that cuts across so many dimensions of diseases, health systems, politics, markets. So in a way, it needs to be integrated a lot better into um, the kinds of systems that we have. Uh, that manage health, uh, systems that are uh, community-driven and community-owned, um, and where policies are responsive. Um, I think one of the problems that arises from that kind of a vertical uh, conceptualization is that how do you start to cost something like AMR? I mean, I've always wondered, how do you cost something like optimizing antibiotic use, which is so challenging? You've got to work with communities. You've got to, you know, get people to um, perhaps understand AMR a little bit more. Um, and you've got to think about uh, the financing that they have, their affordability for completing full courses of antibiotics. You've got to also think about how, um, what kind of veterinary support is available for their animals. And we know that veterinary health systems are as uh, uh, poor as human health systems in many parts of this world. Uh, Colombia, for example, in South America, does not have a public veterinary health system. Uh, the only uh, a source is private veterinary health care, which is very, very expensive. So, you know, given this kind of a situation, how, how does one cost something like optimizing antibiotic use? When you've got to worry about financing, you've got to give people insurance, um, besides uh, making antibiotics accessible to them, and that means not just, you know, uh, making the product as accessible, but making their health providers accessible, which right now are not there. I work with health, informal health markets, where uh, much of health care um, in community settings is delivered by drug shops, um, rural, uh, you know, village doctors in India and in Bangladesh, drug shops in Uganda, patent medicine vendors in Nigeria, um, Tanzania has accredited drug dispensing outlets, 
which are allowed to sell some antibiotics, but they still go beyond that. So how do you manage all of this? It cannot just be through a national action plan. It has to be much more deeply embedded in a nation's thinking. And I think we as a global health community really have a responsibility to make, to, to accept that there is this parallel health system that exists and we need to do something about it. Otherwise, it's, it's you know, we're never going to be able to address AMR. So that is my position. Uh, on it. But having said that, I think AMR is a really useful concept which can be leveraged and I, we have been leveraging it with my teams to actually open a dialogue with policymakers, to open a dialogue with uh, the pharmaceutical industry because it brings a sense of urgency to change practices uh, and, and to review, uh, reflect on uh, one's own contribution to this uh, collective uh, problem, which is going to affect all of us. So, you know, we've been able to uh, get policymakers to accept that some antibiotics should be uh, made available even through providers who do not have a formal medical qualification. We have tried to, you know, uh, even WHO now re I think realizes that this prescription only antibiotic policy has not been successful in most parts of the world. So we need to think of how to make at least the access antibiotics available to a wider uh, population through av all available human resources. So that's where AMR has been really useful in, in, con in changing these policies and in uh, getting people to accept their responsibility. That's what I Thank you. Catherine, thoughts? Um, yeah, so I'm going to reflect. 20 years ago, when I was doing my PhD, um, MRSA was really high in the UK. So the epidemiology of disease has changed. I think it's us that hasn't in some ways. And at the time, it was really difficult to get funding for AMR. That's changed. So there's good points. Um, we, we now have lots of gram-negatives with lots more resistance, and so lots more problems have come up. But there is that funding in order to try to do that, try to uh, um, minimise AMR. But I, I kind of want to talk a bit to what you said, Michael. So I, I was speaking to Jim O'Neill a year or so ago when the, the gram results came out. And actually, what we had in the gram, some of our conclusions were exactly the same as the O'Neill report but it was six years later, and not much had changed. And I think what we need is that implementation. I don't think anything has changed with the big numbers coming out now. We need the implementation, we need to get on the ground, and we need to work together to reduce AMR burden, and we need to really figure out what our priorities are and what our interventions are to be able to do that, and the cost of those interventions to be able to prioritize them. Talking about access antibiotics, the Fleming Fund have been funding the, the MAP project in Africa, and they looked at the antibiotics that were available, and actually 70% of the antibiotics in use were access antibiotics. So they're reaching that, you know, they're not 90%, but they're, they're not too bad, given the current level is 60% um, by the WHO. But then when they looked into it, they only had four antibiotics available. So they had access, but that's all they had. So actually, they need maybe more watch and more reserve antibiotics for the really sick people, and they don't have access to those. So I think that there is definitely nuances in different places, and we have to be sensitive to that, to the cultural differences in those countries, and working together to be able to do this. I think, you know, the, the, in the UK, there's... Um, an opportunity from the UKRI to bring networks together and to work together in a, um, in a sort of transdisciplinary, uh, joined up way. And I think if we could do that globally, that would be the way forward. You know, equally, we're all scientists and we all have our own wants and needs, but we do need to sort of take a step back from that and work together. And, and also going back, Michael, I think what we need in AMR is an intergovernmental panel in that framework to work on AMR. So we're bringing the data together, we're bringing the evidence together globally, and we're making use of that evidence. And we're actually saying to the policymakers and to governments, this is what we need, this is why we need it. And yes, the, the question of how much evidence and what we do with that is you know, the next step, but we just need to work together to do that. Thank you, Catherine. Gadar, any comments on this? 
agreeing with everything that has been said, but I want to emphasize on one point which is aligned to the implementation that I mentioned in my presentation. AMR does have a language problem. I mean, you take it to the ground, if you translate it into many languages, it doesn't really mean anything uh, for many people. So in some places, we sort of almost need to contextualize the problem. In one of the slides that I skipped quickly on, it was uh, looking at AMR in swine production in Colombia. The project does not even talk about AMR. It talks about best practice and how you're going to have a healthy herd because the farmers are very interested in return on investment. And positioning AMR in that context, they are much more interested in what's best for their, for their herd, for their animal. So sometimes when we uh, stick too much to the terminology, it's all very good when we talk at a global level, but when you take it on the ground, when you take it to a mother taking her son or daughter to a doctor, then actually we're talking about a specific issue, clinical condition that she needs to look into and the doctor needs to actually prescribe or not according to uh, the best practice. So the language is a problem. Another thing is that the face of AMR. I mean, with COVID, we've had a lot of um, people uh, coming out and saying, I've had COVID, whether they are famous or not. You can't have a face of AMR. We've had some patients coming out, but actually the face of AMR is still a little bit oblivious to a lot of things. And importantly, AMR is not a vertical challenge, as, as mentioned. It is a cross-cutting. So when we look at the progress that we have made, we need to look at the progress for IPC, for drug development, as well uh, as, as, as other interventions. So I think bringing that bottom up contextualize implementation situation to complement the global uh, situation that we have is, is critical and maybe learning a lot from COVID on what has failed when it comes to global collaboration and, and partnerships. Thank you all of you. So I'd like to take questions from the audience now. If you put your hand up, please wait for the microphone uh, to come. The first question is here, down in the middle. Thank you very much for a really clear presentation. What I picked up was that you guys have got very clear ideas of how a policy, how a system uh, can be developed and implemented. I'm just going to ask one particular question. On the ground, in many resource poor countries, drugs are not given by doctors or nurses. They are given independently by clinics or drug stores in the market. My question is, are you able to give an estimate to how much of the AMR in a country is attributable to such practices? And are you able to give any guidelines on how you might think such practices might be improved? I was really fascinated to hear Dr. Gautam uh, speaking about looking at new ways of working with the private sector. Um, I, I was terrified by that comment. Um, because of the fact that private sector is usually free range and unable to and unwilling to work with government. But I, I wonder if you could address a couple of those points because from the practical side on the ground, it, it is crucial um, to actually be able to tackle these issues. Thank yeah, you, great absolutely. question. Thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate it because it is spot on and it is such a, uh, it's such a blind spot, you know, in global health. Um, going to the first part of your question about um, what estimates do we have uh, with respect to the contribution of, um, you know, what can be loosely termed as this informal private health sector to AMR, um, I don't have any answer for that because we really don't have that level of precise information um, where we can attribute AMR to different sources, whether it's informal markets or the broader private health sector or, um, you know, uh, or even between animal and human health or environmental health, um, pollution from effluents um, which are released by irresponsible uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing plants, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that is really difficult for me to say, and I, I would love to work on that. And I am thinking of pro project ideas where at least we can track uh, 
what proportion of antimicrobials in a country are being sold through these markets. So that will at least give us some idea about, uh, you know, the antibiotic consumption um, across different sectors. Um, the, but what is, I think, what is a concern is that the numbers of these providers are so large. They completely um, outnumber the formal uh, doctors, public sector or private sector. I mean, in India, the public sector is like hardly 20% of the health system, uh, both in terms of healthcare provision and in terms of healthcare seeking. Um, in Nigeria also, it's a similar situation. So you have a very large private sector, and you have like more than 70% of healthcare utilization is in the private sector, and about 70% of that sector is informal. It consists of providers who do not have a formal medical qualification, which means, and, and like they are in millions. So if there is antibiotic dispensing is of course going on, we know that, um, it increased during COVID. Um, so, just in terms of numbers, in terms of the numbers of um, suboptimal courses which are being given uh, to people um, for um, for no uh, clear reason, you know, they are medically not required, they're inappropriate. So, if you just put that together, I think it is a cause for concern. That is all I can say. And we do need strategies to work with this sector, but we also need strategies to think ahead, plan ahead about human resources, and how are we going to uh, slowly replace, you know, these informal health markets with better trained health providers. Um, and that brings us to, the, to another issue of uh, challenging the whole colonial model of medical education and the medical profession which only allows university graduates of medicine to practice uh, medicine, which kind of really limits um, formal healthcare to a very small community of providers who are not there for the people. They are not able to provide healthcare to the masses. So how are we going to rethink this in the years to come is a big question mark. And it's all linked with uh, UHC and you know, AMR. Thank you, Miniksha. Uh, in the interest of time, Are you, okay, quickly? yes, if it's quickly, because there are quite quickly. a few other hands up. I think one thing we don't know is how much AMR there is in the community. So not just anti antimicrobial um, exposure, but AMR. And that some of the work that I'm doing now is actually to understand the burden of AMR in the community. But also some of, I think AMR and AMU, they go hand in hand. So what we've set up within the Adila project is the, the PPS system out in ambulatory health centres. So we have been working with, I think it's 10 countries, we've, we've actually set the system up in five countries to understand what antibiotics are being used in the communities and outpatients, what infections they're being treated for, um, so to get that whole picture of what's happening. So we've got the, the hospital side and the community side to actually have some evidence to know what we're talking about. I think for us, that's the first step. Uh, and it's not just prescribing, it's manufacturing as well. Two-thirds mm. of manufacturers operate outside of the AMI Industry Alliance standards. So um, regulation and education, and but also a just transition. L people's livelihoods depend upon um, on, 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 the, on this market. Um, so there needs to be a just transition. The way that we're trying to uh, execute a just transition from climate change, from dirty fuel to clean fuel, we need to do something similar. But that requires systemic change. Thank you. I saw some other hands up. Uh, there's one at the back and the middle. If we could get a microphone over there. The lady in the yellow shirt. If you could put your hand up. There you go. Thank you very much, um, Gada, for that beautiful presentation. You touch on a lot of things that are close to my heart. I'm very happy about that. Um, we, we've been talking about the medical model, community model, and I'm happy about what um, is it Catherine said, looking at the community. And I'm putting on my Ghanaian hat now and thinking about some of the things we've done at the community level. Um, the issue of terminology, 
and the issue of healthcare seeking behavior. Um, so in, in one of the communities I work in, the local term for antibiotic is tupaye. Tupaye is gunshot. And gunshot, you deal with it quickly and it is gone. So you find people opening up the capsules, mixing it with all kinds of things, and then putting it on wounds, believing that it is gunshot, it will heal quickly. So that, that, is, that is the perception. How do we deal with some of these local perceptions? And like has been said, we need to sit at the community and understand what is going on. First of all, they don't have access to the health facilities. They are so far away. So whatever is made available is what they use. The private sector, that is what is there. Um, we can learn from what was done with the traditional birth attendants. They were causing all kinds of problems. But sitting with them, trying to understand what is going on and providing the means for them to do safe deliveries and knowing that if there's a complication you need to refer made a lot of, of difference. Um, the other thing is the issue of color when it comes to um, antibiotics and drugs at community level. The darker, the better. So if uh, we have black and red and black and green, and so they think that ah, those ones are darker, those are better for the most complicated issues. Then the lighter ones, these ones are pale, they are not good and we will not use them. So I've raised this issue about color and production of, of drugs before. It goes beyond just the community, but it's something that is ingrained at the community level and it's something we need to look at. So the issue about sitting and understanding the context, I think it's important. The clinical model, yes, but people live in communities. They've lived with this for a very long time and we cannot change that overnight and we need to engage with them to understand what the issues are, to be able to work with them to deal with it. My suggestion, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody like to comment on that? Get up. I just want to highlight, it's amazing how in every single culture and country, the perception of the pill and what's actually valuable uh, it, it differs. And that's as well for the animal system as well as the human system. I just want to mention that something that ICAR acknowledged this, but of course, ICARs cannot be everywhere. So the way we are working with the model is to engage in partnership with many of the civil societies that are in the country. Our work in Africa could not have been possible without a close partnership with REACT Africa, which is one of the CSOs that are working with government and community on AMR. So I do think this is the way forward because the local knowledge and the perception of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable cannot be decided from wherever you are in the world. So um, that's why it's a little bit more time consuming to shape up these intervention. It takes us six to eight months to shape up a project. It will be much easier to have a call for proposal and just fund. But this six to eight months will get the people working to understand the culture, the perception, the understanding, and as well of what other things have been happening in the country, which sometimes do not make it to the journal, do not make it to the dashboards or, or any of these capturing mechanisms. It's very interesting. But thank you for this knowledge. This is quite nice. Thank you. Next question, please. There in the front. Four rows from the front. And then over there. Michael Makanga from EDCTP. And my, uh, thank for the, thanks for the very intriguing uh, discussion that is going on. My question relates to the definition of AMR and how this uh, translates to different groups. Uh, do you recommend the society to look at AMR in the context of antibiotics or to look at AMR in the context of uh, microbes in the, broader, in the broader sense, looking at antivirals antibiotics and other antimicrobes. If I may make a comment to this one as the policy advisor to the Society for Drug Resistance, what we decided a few years ago was that we would use the term drug resistance to incorporate all of the microbes which are studied by um, the society's membership. Um, so that's from a, a kind of an official point of view. But I'm quite happy to pass that over to the rest of the panel as well. If anybody wants to make a comment. 
Well, it was interesting because um, I can't remember how many years ago now, but um, God, I don't know if you're at the Wellcome Trust when they commissioned the reframing resistance report. The findings were interesting, um, not least because they canvassed a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. It was very good work. Um, and they concluded in the same way, Adam, that um, the best formulation of words was drug-resistant infection. One, because people readily understood what that meant, and two, because it covered med medico-scientifically all of the event, you know, possibilities of a biological event. However, since that time, I haven't really noticed um, people taking up and embracing and using that phrase, those words, readily. Um, not even the Wellcome Trust, I, I hasten to add. Um, so I, I think language is a lot like microbial matter, organic and it responds in, in relation to pressures in the environment and people end up choosing themselves what phrases and words to use and I don't think, I personally, I don't think it's necessary for us to, to all use the same words all the time because I think there's so much nuance here and the, 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 the cultural context is so very different. I remember Chris Whitty saying, you know, if you're in India, you're probably concerned about resistance will be resistance to TB. If you're in the African continent, you're probably concerned about resistance to malarial treatments. So. It's um, horses for courses, to use the trope, I think. Okay. I? If we can have one brief comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering this in the way that you want it to be answered, but uh, one of my problems with AMR has uh, been that it's, it's all about drugs and bugs. I find that people are missing from this, uh, this whole understanding of, of AMR. And, we do talk about behaviors, but then I think we need to be a lot more person-centric in AMR if you want to be able to change it. Okay, thank you. Can I say a quick One thing? minute. So I agree that behavior is, is a major thing here, and part of our behavior is to silo things down. And AMR has become ABR and, you know, the separate things because that's how we work. But actually, we need to be transdisciplinary. We could learn so much... Working on, on bacteria, we've learned so much on TB, on malaria, on HIV, because it's been done before in many of these areas, but we don't draw upon that because we're siloed. We don't w work together. We don't talk to each other enough, which is why I think this conference is fantastic. Because we've got malaria, we've got HIV, we've got people who've been in this area for a long time, and we can draw upon each other and, and talk to each other as well, which you know I think is fantastic. Thank you, Katrin. We have a question down here. Thank you for being patient. Uh, it's Henry Wondumba from Malawi. Um, just, I've got a question for uh, Gada and then a, a short comment. I wanted to understand how you engage uh, with ministries in different countries um, and how you also work with other players in, in those countries, for example, where the Fleming Fund is, is operating. Um, and my, my other comment is the whole issue of um, drug resistance, antimicrobial resistance is really complex and in certain countries it's actually a political issue because if you're operating in a country where you have you know, persistent drug outages in hospitals, patients cannot find the antibiotics, people are forced to go elsewhere to find those antibiotics and therefore they, you know, they turn to the informal sector uh, who you don't know how they get their drugs, the quality of the drugs, but they have to get something uh, for treatment. Uh, and if you clamp down on those uh, providers, it becomes a big issue for the government because then you have a dissatisfied population uh, which cannot get services from the government and cannot get services from the informal sector. What do you do as a politician? You cast a blind eye and let things happen. And this is happening across Southern Africa. They, the government knows it's happening, but they just haven't got a mechanism to control it for largely political reasons. And I don't know how you can work to address those issues so that you regularize the system and have a system that works, but also you know, deals with the issue of antimicrobial resistance. I'm probably better placed to answer the first bit because the second one is beyond ICARS, but I'll say a couple of words. So um, when ICARS started, it was very much with existing contact within ICARS to ministries. But now as we have starting to show case studies, which I think is another way where we can show that how certain countries are taking steps, like Kyrgyzstan, showing that they are already reducing by 40%. By highlighting these case studies, we're having more demands from the AMR coordinating committees within the country which advise the government. So they reach out to us. That hasn't been the case when we started because we were new and nobody understood what we were doing. But as we progress and we move from one country to another, 
when we are showing how we are working, then there are more countries coming to us. So, so, so far, it's been 16 countries, 32 projects, and every year we have six to eight that at least get supported, whereas we have a highest demand coming from different countries wanting to do different aspects. So I think the modality of working and engaging at the local level via our contact in countries, via our contact within societies like REACT, for example, where they already helped a lot the government in Africa, many government in Africa developed their national action plan and facilitated our work, as well as our engagement with the quadripartite, WHO, FAO, WOW, and others have been really strong, as well as the Fleming Fund and other initiatives. So when we are in one country, that's the six to eight months taking to co-develop is really to scope who is there who's doing what. Currently, we have a, a project that has a lot of uh, pharma, it's called Pharma Field School in Africa, and it's the FAO who's actually leading on this one. But we don't really need to duplicate it. So we're bringing FAO as one of the partners, as well as uh, the Zimbabwean government who's really uh, interested to test that model. So suddenly, you have a consortium of the government and the researchers. You have sometimes you and agencies, and you could have some Fleming Fund and other uh, recipient who seems to be the same one collecting some of the data if it is a human health in this case. For the second question that you have, I put political will at the beginning because really it's beyond any organization as small as ICARS to, to be able to address these issues of regulation. And as such, I think it is a problem and it is a problem that even in high-income countries, um, in some of the southern European countries, you do not always have control of what antibiotics you use. The online purchasing of antibiotics is being problematic even in, in so some of the southern European countries. And if we look at the United States, they have their own challenges as well with unnecessary use of antibiotics. So it is a big problem. But it is with the hand of the government, and no program or initiative can actually help with this. Of course, each government has to try to find their alternative. And maybe working at a regional level could be a very good starting point, because cross-border antibiotic use and movement is a big issue with many countries. Thank you very much, Gadar, and thank you, Henry, for the question. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for um, this morning, because I realize that we are standing in the way of coffee. <laughs> Um, so what I would like to do is to uh, thank all of my panel members today um, and yourselves for the questions. I think it's been an extraordinarily detailed and interesting session. <laughs>